Luke chapter 15, verse 1 through 7, New International Version. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until you find it? And when you find it, joyfully put it on your shoulders and then go home. Then you would call your friends and neighbors together and say, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need repentance. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, may the words from my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I ask that you now hide me behind the cross that they may only see your guiding light and soften my voice that they may only hear your redeeming words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, this being the fourth installment on our sermon series on community outreach, I'd like to preach from the subject, just one, seek, carry, and celebrate. Just one, seek, carry, and celebrate. Have any of you ever questioned the Bible, or particularly questioned some of the stories in the Bible? For example, there was this guy named Enoch who lived 365 years. And then there was another one named Lamach who lived 777 years. And then of course we all know Noah who lived 950 years. But the one who holds the record is Methuselah, who lived 969 years. Well, the way I see it, the only one that could confirm Methuselah's age is Methuselah. And I can't speak for you, but I can't remember what I ate three days ago. 969 years. And then there's the story of Jonah, who was swallowed by a fish and managed to live three days inside its stomach. And then there's the story of the Hebrew slaves who crossed the Red Sea. We've seen all the, the stories uh, of how there's this wall of water on both sides. Hard to believe. And then there, these are all, of course, Old Testament stories, but we also have some New Testament stories that sometimes are hard to grasp. There's the apostles speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost, which today we now celebrate. And then there's Peter walking on water. Now I get it when Jesus walked on water, but Peter walked on water? All questions that we may rattle around in our heads about the Bible, but for the record, I believe in all of them in some shape, form, or fashion. But there is this parable, this particular parable that I struggled with when I first brought it up as something to study today. It does not, of course, fall in the same genre of Methuselah, but it is something that brought me question. The first question was, who could possibly manage 100 sheep by themselves? That's a lot of sheep. The second is, I would imagine that a shepherd would feed his sheep along with other shepherds in the same locations. So how would the shepherd know his sheep from someone else's sheep? And then the third question was, if I only lost one sheep of 100, would I risk losing more sheep by leaving the 99? Questions all these questions about this particular parable. 
Well, I will tell you that through my research, it helped me to not only answer these questions, but it also explains why Jesus told this story to the Pharisees and the teachers. The answer to the first question, 100 sheep would not have been shepherded by one person. A shepherd would lead approximately 30 to 40 sheep by themselves, and that is called a flock. But more than 30 or 40 sheep is called a fold. Flock, fold, that's important. The answer to the second question. Shepherds would feed their sheep in fields, and of course take them down to streams of water in folds as a group. They would also protect their sheep from wild animals with their rods and staff as a team, along with their sheepdogs. And then the third answer. Shepherds gave each of their sheep a name so that when evening came or after an attack by wild animals, they would count their sheep by calling them by name. And the sheep knew their shepherd's voice and would follow them. Does that sound familiar? The sheep knows the shepherd's voice. So now let's see how this information unfolds in scripture. And more importantly, how it teaches us to be disciples and apostles in kingdom building. Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, what I find interesting is that the Pharisees who said these words apparently forgot that they were sinners too. Amen? Isn't that interesting how religious leaders and teachers uh, don't put themselves in the same category as everybody else? Amen? I'm talking about folks that stand in pulpits. I'm talking about folks who teach our children how to lead by example, but yet lead a different way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How they say that their sins are worse than their own sins. I thought that was interesting, that the Pharisees and teachers foremost thought that, you know what, how could he possibly be talking to sinners, forgetting that they were sinners themselves. So let's see what happens. Jesus then tells this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until you find it? If a shepherd left a fold of sheep, remember it was a hundred, they didn't leave the 99 unprotected. See how that works? So I find this very interesting. One of the concerns of growing a church is feeling that you might be left behind or forgotten. People get a little leery when churches grow because they wonder if we get too big, will I be forgotten? Will I be left behind? Will I be left in the margin? Will the pastor remember my name? Well, Jesus is telling this story after you unpack it to realize that you need multiple pastoral caregivers in the life of a church, not just the pastor. Amen? You need multiple pastoral caregivers. Now, let me give you a little history about the United Methodist Church. Before we became United Methodists, Churches were led by lay servants. In fact, you might see the pastor once a quarter every three months. He came to do three things, baptize, provide communion, and to marry folks. All the other months, someone else was in the pulpit. All the other months, someone else was taking care of the sheep. And they kept asking each other this one question. How is it with your soul? That's the one question. Every time they met, they asked the same question. How is it with 
your soul. And they held each other accountable for their salvation, for their walk with Jesus Christ. Well, now in the United Methodist context, we still have lay servants, and we also have what's called certified lay ministers. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. The text goes on and says, And when you find the sheep, joyfully put it upon your shoulders and go home. Then you would call your friends and neighbors together and saying, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. A sheep in this parable was referring to a person that you know in your immediate circle by name. Someone of whom you share residence, someone of whom you feel that you need to protect, someone of whom you care for. And because Jesus is referring to a fold of sheep, these would also be people outside your immediate circle as well. People that perhaps you dine with, people that you share conversations with, and when necessary, people that you will protect on the behalf of someone else. And thus, the same questions are being asked of us today. When you have a relationship with someone that you call by name, would you allow them to remain lost without you? Out there alone and afraid? Wouldn't you go looking for them? Perhaps dispatch an amber alert or a silver alert. Get on social media or the networks to make sure that this person whom you know is lost might be found. When you do everything in your power to contact your friends and family to make sure whoever that loved one that you're thinking about is brought back into the fold? And wouldn't you carry them if they were injured? I would imagine that this text is talking about when the shepherd carried the sheep, that there was something wrong with the sheep. Otherwise, he would just simply let the sheep follow him. So I would imagine that this sheep was injured which is why I couldn't keep up with the fold. Wouldn't you carry someone who's injured emotionally, spiritually, physically, someone of whom you know by name to make sure that they would return to the fold, to a way of salvation that John Wesley continues to preach, preach to us in his words as well. But most importantly, wouldn't you rejoice and celebrate once you were found? For example, can you imagine how that community felt when that child was found after days being under the rubble after the, after the tornado? Can you imagine how they rejoiced over that? I rejoiced, and I didn't even know the child. Can you imagine how you rejoiced if there was someone of whom you know had been lost and had didn't have a relationship with God or who you know had not been in the community of fellowship with other people. How you would rejoice if you saw them again and had worship with them. Just last week, I, uh, there was a woman who was here and, and the choir was just ecstatic that she was present because they hadn't seen her in a while. That's the same type of rejoicing that Jesus talks about. The same type of rejoicing that took place in the story or the parable of the prodigal son who had been lost out there doing everything and anything. Anybody got any children like that? Hmm? Doing everything and anything, but finally realized if I could just go back to my father's house, everything would be all right. Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need repentance. Church, as I said on last week, it's time to go get them. It's time to go get them. These are the same people that you know personally by name. Some of them live in your households. Some of them work on your job. Some of them are your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, your family. You know them by name. It's time to go get them. They're lost. And if they stay out there too long, the wild animals will devour them. 
But here's the catch. Here's the catch. These persons that are lost, these persons that need, be, need, that need to be in the fellowship of God, that need to be in the fellowship of believers, they don't necessarily have to join Milford Mill United Methodist Church. We're in kingdom building. As long as they're in the fellowship of Jesus and God, that's what matters. That's what matters. A young man said to me when I was talking to him just this week, um, Pastor, I, I, I mentor kids, and I do that through uh, a sport that he teaches. And that sport takes me away and, uh, um, on a lot of Saturdays and Sundays, so I'm not in worship all the time. He says, and I, and I quote, you do it your way, and I do it my way. You do it your way, and I do it my way. What John Wesley said, go forth and preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. He's asking for us to be examples. He's asking for us to be protectors. He's asking for us to be caregivers. He's asking us to bring others into the fold. They may not be your sheep, but then again, some of them are. And you know them by name. It's time to go get them. Just one. It's time to seek. It's time to carry. It's time to celebrate. And so I'm going to ask you a question. Do you feel called to be a lay servant? Someone who's willing to lead, to be a caregiver? in the life of the church? Do you feel called to be a certified lay minister, someone who will literally be trained in the same manner in which pastors are trained, but yet you will stay within the local context of the church through a covenant relationship? If any of this sounds like you, if any of this sounds like you wanna be a caregiver for souls, caregivers of people that you love, even if you just wanna learn how to love someone better, I want you to put your name on a piece of paper and put it in the offering plate so that we can continue this conversation. Because at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. It's the commandment of the Great Commission to go and seek, to carry, and to celebrate. And the church said, Amen.